about the um, I really uh, there was a movie back in the day you know if you guys that know it was called it's all about the Benjamin but we don't we're not Benjamin that we have on our uh, notes so it's what Madiba there and it basically spoke about the first thing Pastor Lawrence spoke about stewardship and obedience um, the week after that I spoke last week that it's all about the ten payment and uh, to those of you who don't know want to still go and find that sermon you can check it out on Facebook or on YouTube on our YouTube page um, as we dealt with that over the last couple of weeks, the last two weeks. Um, and last week I spoke about the fact that it's all about the test. And what do I mean about test? Because I mean that I ask God, why would the Lord say 10% of the tithe or the offering is made for the house? Amen? When you say, take the tithe to the storehouse. And we mentioned last week that the storehouse is the church. And I also went against all of these many conversations where people came and said, no, my tithe I give to the poor people. My tithe I give to the... The Bible does not say that is what we do with the tithe. The Bible says you take it to the storehouse and to the church. Whatever you do above that is an offering. Amen? Whatever you do above that is either sacrificial offering or it is an offering that you give from your heart. But the tithe, the 10% goes to the storehouse and we ask the question, why 10%? And we realize that the word tithe and the word tent in the Bible and I mentioned many different portions of scripture where I showed you the ten commandments was a tent the ten plagues in Egypt was against Pharaoh was ten we realize that there's so many different tents in the Bible we realize Daniel also being in time of testing was ten we find that the number ten symbolically testing and that's why whenever God comes and he tells you to pay or give a tithe, he's coming and he's saying a test of the heart. But more above that, what I went and I mentioned last week was the fact that Jesus said, what to look after my bride. Amen. I made the example where I had three gentlemen on the stage where I said, um, so I'm the husband and I say, I'm about to leave. And as I'm about to leave, um, and as I'm about to leave, one of the things we actually realized there, I mentioned that me as being the husband, I said, I'll give each of them thousand rand. But all of all I want from them is ten percent. My wife. Because I said, I'll come back. All you guys have got to do is look after soup. And as you come and you look after soup, make hundred percent sure that per ten. Each of them must just come and give her a ten percent. Amen. So, um, like I said, so each of you, or each of them should go and give a 10%. But God put us here because he says my church must be looked after. Amen? How many of us agree, as we dealt with last week in the book of Deuteronomy 26, where the Bible came and showed us that everything you have belongs to God. Amen? God gave it and God blessed you with it. Amen? And all God is saying from the 10 from the 100% I give you, I just want 10%. Look after my bride. Because the church and the gospel needs money. It's run by finance in order to push the gospel forward. And I don't know about you, but better is 90% with God's blessing than 100% without it. You know what I'm saying? Better is 90% with God's blessing then 100% without it. And that's why this morning we're coming into the new one. It's all about the kingdom. And I wonder if, I wonder what I would have, I would have if I did not know what everybody else had. You know what I'm saying? I wonder what I would have had or have right now if I did not know what anybody else had. Or have. I also wonder what I would want if I did not know what everybody else had. I also wonder what I would have saved if I didn't know what you had. I also wonder how much I would have given away to people who have less than I have if I did not know how much people who had more than I do 
have. Because we live in a society where we want to go around and impress people who do not know us. Buy things so that people can see just because of what I saw someone else have. The problem is we know too much of what others have and what I don't. And the issue with this is it makes us so discontent. We you never have peace. We find ourselves sometimes, many a times in financial ruins. We find ourselves in debt because we want to please people we don't know. We find out that we make decisions by wasting because we want to feed this appetite, this internal appetite over and over again that is never satisfied. We always want the upgrade. And many of you might be asking, Pastor, how is this possible? This, this month you buy yourself the latest iPhone. Guess what? A couple of months later, the new later iPhone comes out and you want that one. Let's be real. You thought you just bought the nicest shoe on the market. And before you know it, you find yourself in the place where months later, you're no longer satisfied with it. You buy yourself the nicest jewelry. But we find ourselves in this place where we are never ever satisfied. Why? God has never made us or created us so that stuff can fill the void. And I don't know about you, but I need counseling. I'm sure most of us do. Amen. Most of us need counseling. Amen. It brings me to one of the things that I've realized. Um, I don't know if you've driven before and you've seen the guardrail. If you, especially if you're on a highway. There's normally a rail on the side. Amen. So you see the rail while you are driving. And when you look at the, the meaning of what this is for, a guardrail is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. Say it again. A guardrail is a system to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. And I don't know about you, but I for sure need some guardrails in my life. Amen? I need some guardrails in every area of my life. Amen? Whether it's financial guardrails. Amen? Whether it's relational guardrails. Whether it's career guardrails. This is the part where I spoke last week where the Bible says that God gave ordinances to the people of Israel and they turned back from the ordinances that He gave. And when you break up the word ordinance, you find out that the ordinance is the everyday living and habit that God expects us to live as a Christian. So God came and He gave us ordinances, but the ordinances came with guardrails. Amen? Because as I mentioned, even though we are living under the new dispensation, when God gave the Ten Commandments, it was given to save you from you. What would the world be without guardrails and a law and a system in place? As the scripture says, thou shalt not murder. It was under the law, but it's still not right now. So we find that the guardrails and stuff has been put in place as a moral compass to keep us from going off-road or into dangerous off-limit areas. Amen? And today we are looking at some financial guardrails. You can be out of debt and have a lot of money in the bank, but still be in trouble. According to Jesus, you can still be in the ditch. You can even give financial seminars out there. Because Jesus Christ in His time comes and He speaks about the heart of the matter. It's not about the stuff of the matter. It's not about the material possession of the matter. Jesus comes and He speaks about the heart of the matter. And in the scriptures, as I said, finances, and when we see this, this combination between treasures and the heart is the second most thing spoken about. In the scriptures because Jesus understood and the scriptures understood that how we can lose our way because of the different treasures and not making the kingdom our treasure there's over 2,000 scriptures 
just about finances and treasures and the matter of the heart. Matthew 6 verse 24. You take out your Bibles, take out your notebooks as we are a church that believes in notebooks, that believes in taking down the word. Those who are online as well, just type it for us in the bottom section over there. Let us read the word of the Lord together. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's read it again. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Another translation says you cannot serve God and money. The Greek here, word here when it comes to master. The other one says you either, the, the one, you cannot serve two masters. Masters, when you look at the Greek word and the meaning thereof, it speaks about ownership and possession. You can only have one owner. You cannot serve God and money. Another word is stuff. The primary issue regarding Money for Jesus is mastery, control, and ownership. And many of us can say what we need to say or can try and act as holy as it is. But out there, many of us, it's all about the grind. It's all about the hustle and bustle. It's all about the paper chase. But I'm here to come and tell you guys, it's not about the paper chase. The Bible does not use words like hustle and grind. Because when you live under grace and the new dispensation, you understand I don't hustle or grind. Because God supplies all my needs according to His riches in glory. Don't hustle. And now I'm stepping on toes again. What I'm saying is, the Bible says you can only have two masters. Either you serve Jesus, the Lord our God, money, or mammon, or stuff. And many of us find ourselves in the place, as I mentioned last week, the Bible shows us in the Deuteronomy that the first fruits must be paid to the storehouse. That's why Cain and Abel's offerings were so different, even though both of them gave. The one gave of the first fruits. And that's why I mentioned last week, the moment your salary drops, you tithe. Because where the first payment goes to, that is who you worship. Why? The moment you pay your tithe, you separate yourself from the love of money. That brings me to my next point. Do we have money or stuff? Or does money or stuff have us? You know what I'm saying? Do we have money or stuff? Or does stuff or money have us? Do we own it or does it own us? There was a time I really loved clothes. I love clothes and fashion and stuff. I mean, the click of it, keep going kiss Sop not. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, family, is I realized that I had a problem with clothes. I love clothes and I used to buy clothes and my cupboard is full of clothes and everything. But there came a place in my life where I realized I had a problem with the stuff having me. I could not walk into a shop without getting something and I'm confessing here. And I know it might not be a lot of gentlemen, but ladies, can some of you agree with me here? Come on, let's just confess our struggles here. Ladies, let's just confess our struggles here. Come on. You guys cannot walk into a shop without coming out with two pairs of shoes or three pairs of shoes that you maybe wear once a year or so. Come on, let's just be honest. We are in the church this morning. Amen. Those who are online, just be honest. Let's just confess. Amen. Let's heal this morning. Who wants to heal with me? Amen. Let's heal this morning. And so we find ourselves in this place where we all need healing. Amen. And I rely that stuff had me. And you know what? I had to put myself on a shopping fast. My wife will tell you whenever she goes to the shops, I don't go with. When we go into a mall or somewhere, I don't go. And then God had to teach me the art of really, really disciplining myself when it comes to certain things. But I first had to separate myself from it because separation brings and takes away the longing for it. So the next time I encounter it, God then built up in me the discipline 
When I come to a shop and I see a black t-shirt that I might like, I ask myself first, do I have a black t-shirt like this at home? And if I find myself saying yes, then I say, then I, I don't know about you, but I speak to me. And I say, Cheslin, and myself says, hmm. And I say, it's enough now. You don't need this. Then myself says, mm -mm. and I say, self, you better listen to me. Then you, you guys, I might sound, I'm just saying what you think all the time. Because you start fighting with yourself in the mind. Come on, man, it's just this. Ah, it's, it's us. If they say sale, Lorica, it's even worse. If they say there's a discount on it, now you feel more the reason. But you have three of those at home already in the cupboard. But somehow the discount arouses you to think, ah, I need it right now. I don't know if somebody can agree with me right here. We have believers here. Amen. When the discount is there, all of a sudden now you feel the more need to have it. And you find yourself in that place where you're like, okay, do I own it or does it own me? Money and what God promises is the number one competitor to our hearts and ownership with God. You may never have bankruptcy as I've just said, and you can be so good with money. But without, God, without any guardrails, you can go into overconsumption or warding up things. I come from a time, my oma, jammer man oma, I can't be for you, be exposed now. Confessing here, I don't know about you guys, but when we come into our granny's homes, you find a bottle or a glass given at a wedding 20 years ago. Ha! Ah, I don't know who can relate with me here. <laughs> Our grandparents or people have, have a tendency just to hold on to things. Myself and my mother had a conversation about this now that the Yammer Mimayak exposed it. No, for you. We spoke about this tea, this, this set, uh, 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 a tea set or uh, no cutlery and I asked her ma this stuff has been here for the last 25 years when are we going to ever use it the, and I don't think the president's coming anytime soon right now but I asked her when are we using it because there's so much things in your house and in my house let's just be honest that extra kettle you thought you would use but it's standing there for another 10 years and now all of a sudden you're asking yourself when are we ever going to use this but your parents will always tell you it's for those special days for that special occasion but when that special occasion comes you don't still use it it still just stands there smiling at you every single guys let's be real as I run divider up mark they got to tell stuff up that bana let us just be real with each other here so we find ourselves hoarding stuff and just keeping stuff in our homes that we never use we just become over we just over consume over consume who come no that get in pack of chips it's be real why tin Packets of chips. Because if we had to go and scratch in your cupboard right now, I guarantee you, I will find a whole lot of expired goods. Stepping on toes this morning. Ah, how, many, how much expired goods will I find? See the ladies just looking at each other. My wife will tell you in the beginning of our marriage we used to throw away a lot of stuff because we didn't really know what to buy or how often we used to eat. But after a while, I told her, we are wasting. The one desire is just to upgrade and consume. The other sphere is, what if I don't have enough? What if we don't have enough? So the other one is just consuming all the time. But the other person in this room sitting here is always, what if I don't have enough? What if we don't have enough? So what they end up doing and finding themselves in the place is they end up keeping all the time. The root cause of both of these people is greed. You know what I'm saying? The root cause from both of these people is greed. Greed is the assumption that it is all for my consumption. Greed is the assumption that it is all for my consumption. If it's in my account, if it's in my pension, if it's in my bonus, if it's in my inheritance, that lottery, everything around there is for me. It's my consumption. If I choose to give it to someone what is designed for me, even though I know it's for me, I end up giving it slowly.
That's the world we are living in. Where even if you do something good, because even though you are giving it away, you still want it to be all about you. It still comes from a place of greed. The Bible says when your right hand is doing something, your left hand should not even know. But greed brings us all down to this thing where it's all about me. In my cons- it's in my bank account. It's, this, it's mine. And we have this thing consumed now. Spend. And consume later. It's hoarding. You're just keeping up stuff. It's all about me now. It's all about me later. But the trouble comes along all the time. And I don't know about you guys, but whenever we overspend or we don't do what is required of us according to the scriptures and we waste our money, we make some bad financial decisions or whoever's at home right now, someone outside done you in and they done something against you that lost you a lot of money. Whenever we are in trouble, we have nowhere to go to. We know where to pray. I'm not lying to you guys. The amount of people I've seen at different conferences and places that I've spoken at, in churches and wherever I have been around, the moment I say who needs financial breakthrough, Amal Sanders, oh, say yes! Yes! Because all of a sudden, now that I need a financial breakthrough, I know where to grant to. I've never seen people pray as much as when they need a financial breakthrough or they need of finances. But the problem here is why only invite God into your finances when you need Him? When your finances was good, all of a sudden God was not there. Because now He must come and do damage control over and over again in your finances, but you did not invite Him in when it was most needed. But the reason we don't want to do that, Mr. Shan, is because God gives us principles and ordinances for us to work our money. And now that I call Him in when I'm in desperate need of things because I'm in trouble, now I want His help. But we still don't understand. God is not a man that God will lie. God knows our intentions of our heart. And God will come in and say, I'm going to help you set up guardrails so that you don't end up being in the same place again. And I'm here to tell you this this morning, family. If you keep making bad financial decisions, you need to see a financial advisor. You might think I'm being... You need to see a financial advisor. Last week I spoke about it. I said, when last did you draw up a budget to find out where every single cent is going? How much do I spend on entertainment? How much a month for petrol? How much for this? But you will not know that because you have not sorted out your heart and finances. You've either gone to the place where you've spent too much and you are busy over-consuming or you find yourself in the place where you just hold. And you end up asking yourself, what if I don't have enough? But because the principle is not in place, you're not operating under the blessing. How do you set yourself free and allow yourself to be set up for success when it comes to money? You've got to reprioritize. You've got to reprioritize. Most of us live our lives by living, number one, then saving, and then giving. You know what I'm saying? Most of us are in our lives where we first want to live. Yours, pay the ha, he la la, and can you eat? How will you eat? Ah, that's okay. Guys, pay the chicken licking is packed. I don't know about you guys. Chicken licking is packed, pay the ha, Mr. Shen. If that money drops, we live. Guys, ha. Specials, Nana, Studio 88 vibes, ha. We are in every single shop. Payday drops. We just, we, it's like we can't wait in anticipation. Are you going to drop? Did your money drop? <laughs> Me, what you going to do? Ah, no, don't worry. Ah, food. Gonna, ah, what? Last week, 
We had to drive till there to go pick up the food. Hi, Mr. Delivery. <laughs> I got paid. <laughs> and most of you are laughing right now because you can relate. When money drops, the first thing we do is live. After we now spend, now you decide, okay, no, you know, maybe I want to save now. So now the saving comes in. You say, okay, I'm going to save a bit now. And then last on your list, we, we then want to give the leftovers. But I'm here to tell you guys this morning that the God we serve is not a leftover God. God wants to know where do you prioritize Him and His kingdom on your agenda. And that is why you don't operate under the blessing because you first want to live, then you want to save, then you want to give. But God comes in here and He says, what? Me first, me second, and everybody else third. That is how you want to live. When you live this way, you are mastered because you are living as if there is no more to this life than this life. And most people live this way. Jesus says, if you want, to be, if you want me to be the master of your life, you must embrace the way I see finances. You must embrace the way I see values. And I've got a couple of jars here this morning that I want you to see. Because if you live according to the principle of God, and as I said, under the new dispensation, it's not the fact that when you don't give, you get cursed. But it's the fact that when you do not do things according to God's plan and the way God instructs us to, you do things without His blessing. You know what I'm saying? You do things without His blessing. So most of us end up living first, saving second, and giving last. But God is coming in here this morning and I'm giving you a new formula that you can live by. And I guarantee you, I'm challenging you. Come back to me in three months' time. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to put my head on the block here. You know, those watching online, you guys might also, my, 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 my leaders are looking at me, my elders are looking at me right now, but I'm going to put my, my head on the block here. <laughs> Cliff, if people follow this, I'm going to put you to the challenge here. We are not doing this in regards to the fact that God is a genie. Just pull the, the lotto thingy and then boom. There's, no, no, God doesn't operate that way. God wants you to operate and live life according to the blessing. These jars over here, Delmain, you'll just get those for me and just bring them in. But I'm going to put my, my head on the block here this morning. God wants us to give first. Just repeat after me. Say, give first. Save second, and live third. Say it again. Give first, save second, and live third. If you put this to the test in the next three months, I'm saying this so that you can see God's faithfulness. And by you putting this practice in place and by you giving to the house of God, if you do not see breakthrough in your life in the next three months, you can come and we will give you a tithe back. I know I'm being a bit radical right now. But I'm here to come and try and show you if you live life according to the blessings that God puts in place, that you are guaranteed breakthrough. Because the Bible says that God has our good in store for us. Amen. That our Father looks after us. That He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But the problem is we are living life without the blessing. Number one, the moment you are there, you give 10%. And the Bible doesn't just cap it here because there's many of us that give more than the 10%. And it's fine because God loves a cheerful. Second, you save 10%. Okay? So, first jar. Once my, once my kids are old enough to understand the suki, I'll get them the shrine. They'll you know, have jars here because my kids are speaking in dollars right now. You guys must please pray for me. Please pray for me. Yo, guys, YouTube is ruining my kids. Don't know about you guys, but yo, when I give my child and I say, how much is that? Five dollars, daddy, five dollars. Now look at Sue, where did we go wrong? Where did we go wrong? So, give first, save second, and live off the 80%. 
The moment your finances drop, family, I want to implore you with this challenge. Give the 10%. God gave it to you. Amen. And you are just honoring Him because you want to make sure. The Bible says having money is not the problem. The love of money is the issue. But it says give the 10%. Give it to the storehouse. And if you give more, pray, bless the Lord. All my soul. Because it still belongs to Him. But make sure that you also save a 10%. Okay? And you make sure that you live off the rest. Um, there's an app Brandon Hanukkah um, revealed to me a couple of months ago. Even those who are online. Um, the app was called Stash or something. I'm not advertising. I don't get paid by them or nothing. But it just saves on your behalf. Get yourself into a plan. And that's why I'm saying go find and see a financial advisor. If you find yourself continuously making financial decisions year after year that are not good, sit with a financial advisor, figure out how you spend your finances, and then you put this practice into play. You let your financial advisor know, I want to give 10%, I want to save 10%, and I want to make sure that I can live off the rest. Some of us are living off 50% because we are saving 30 and giving 20. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But you are wondering why the blessing of the Lord is not operating within your life. The reason why I'm saying this is this is the key to financial independence from the belief that life equals stuff. You know what I'm saying? This is the key to financial independence from the belief that life equals stuff. No matter what you have, you will always be discontent and not happy with what you have. Because unfortunately, Mr. Shan, if you die, you leave your stuff behind. I don't know if you are seeing it that way. You live as if your life is stuff, but your life is actually your time. Time is of the most important commodities that we have in this time. And God is not going to come and judge you based on the stuff that you have. He's going to judge you based on the time. What have you done with the time I have blessed you with on this earth? Why live as your stuff master and control you? This will make you live as if you only talk to God in emergencies. <laughs> only when you need Him. And the sad thing is most of us only have that kind of relationship with Him. That, we, that you, you, you serve an emergency God. An ER24 God. Doesn't hear from you at all when things are well. But the moment an emergency hits, all of a sudden, Father God, Jesus, Father God, just come and bless me, Father God. Have you? We know where to go. And God doesn't want that kind of relationship with you this morning. God says, I want a relationship with you that consists out of time. Hallelujah. Time. I want all of you. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants all of me. Money will always try and compete for the first place above God. Money and stuff. And God doesn't want money to win. Neither do I. You don't ever want to raise your kids or live your life where you have to choose between money and your personal peace. Or prioritize money over your marriage or prioritize money over your children because you've became you've become a slave to overconsumption the same thing with your kids the thing that your kids love is not the fact that you are giving money to them it's also the fact that what's most valuable is time Matthew 6 verse 24 God wants you to have stuff and not stuff have you. Just say that after me. God wants me to have stuff and not stuff have me. Because no man can serve two masters. Matthew 6 verse 31 to 32. Does this hear what the beautiful thing of the scripture said? Let's read it together. Therefore do not worry saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. That song that says, if he dresses the lilies, ah, 
with beauty and splendor. How much more doesn't God love you? If God can make sure that the bird has food to eat every day and a place to sleep, if you are a child and a son and a daughter of God this morning, how much more doesn't He just love you? Because the Bible says He knows all your needs. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. Even though Cassia or Area might think they need that sweets, I know they need pro neutro eat my cunt. Come on, somebody. I don't know if you understand, but the problem is many a times you want something that God does not see that you need it right now. Because if you want it right now, it can destroy you. And be bad for your cavities. It can you mach upset? You end up having to use the toilet later because you will feel like food poisoning. Because your wants and what God knows what you want and need is different. But God is here to show you that if I can feed and look after the earth, I can tell the ocean up to a year and no further. I can tell the stars you shine so bright and only there. I can tell the sun so hot and you stay that way. How much more doesn't God love you? Who he has made in his own image and his likeness. Glory, hallelujah. Why do you need to worry? The Bible says worry doesn't add a single day to your life. Today has troubles of its own. But God is saying, why worry? He's saying, relax, son and daughter of God. I've got this. I'm your father. I know what you need. But if you live according to what I have put in place, you will be covered. You will operate under my blessing. But if you do not, you'll find yourself in the place where you are going to worry. God knows what you need even before you even know it. And that's why... You don't have to keep your hand closed. Which brings me to my last point. Matthew 6 verse 33. Let's read it together. But seek, but seek, but seek, but seek, but seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be and all these things will be and all these things will be I rest my case Mr. Shen seek first says reprioritize reorder rearrange Jesus is saying, my father's kingdom is an other's first kingdom. The Bible is showing us that when you think of others, God will put you in the place where pride can't creep in. Because humbleness and being humble is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And God is saying in this kingdom, it's an other's first kingdom. If you want God to control your finances, put others first. Put His agenda first. It's God's preference, not yours. If God says 10, let it be 10. Because it's His preference. He wants to make sure that we have stuff and stuff does not have us. Matthew 23 verse 11 to 12. In the message version. Matthew 23 verse 11 to 12. Bible comes and says, but he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. The next one, verse 12. And whoever exalts himself will be, but whoever humbles himself will be. If there's advice I can give you this morning is you humble you. Don't let God humble you. Because the Bible says the humble shall be exalted. 
and reprioritizing and ordering, putting things in your life will make you understand. And God will bring that levelness because he'll, he'll make you understand that you put others first. You put his kingdom first. You seek first his agenda for your life before putting your own agenda. Father, I know I want that cell phone right now, but what is your agenda? Where do I see a need for your kingdom? Where do I see a need for what you want? Father God Almighty, I know I want to sleep late this morning, but Father God, once again, where's your agenda? Oh, we have to be at church at quarter past nine because we must come and serve. Okay, Father, your agenda comes first because I can be on time for work because I get paid there, but I struggle to be on time for church because my agenda comes before that. But God is again saying, are you seeking me first? Are you seeking my kingdom first? But God is in the place here this morning where he's saying you've got to rearrange, reprioritize, replace things in, my, in your life that will bring glory to my kingdom. Because still trying to do it on your own will not bring you anywhere. Selflessness won't solve, will not solve. Selflessness will solve everything. The problem in the world right now we have, it's too selfish. And the Bible says in the last days people will be lovers of themselves. Are we seeing it? Are we seeing it? It's all about me, fly ha, so ha, fly like the sky, you don't know why, come on baby, look at me now, ha, rest on my watch with the bling bling, ha, looking at me with the fling fling, ha, look at me now, look at us now, ha, we're doing this thing like now, like there, look at us, gold tooth in the air, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> I think I must go do an album, huh? I think I must go and must go do this thing, man. Family, I don't know about you, but the world we are living in, we are seeing the last days played out right before us. But the Bible says my kingdom is an upside down kingdom because we are here to come and represent the king. That's why it says on earth as it is in. We are here to come and infiltrate, invade, occupy and transform. And change the culture. That's why in here we have a kingdom culture, not a government culture. This is Jesus' culture being displayed. But as you come and get equipped here, wherever you go, the kingdom of God should infiltrate. Because the order in your heart and in your life is seek first. At work, seek first. At home, seek first. That's the only way we can make a difference in this world. And that's the only way the world will know that Jesus is alive and the healer of this world. Hallelujah. Is if we are ambassadors of this kingdom of God. Only once you seek first, God will tell you, relax. Everything else will come along. This is how you make sure that you have money. And money doesn't have you. To stand up on our feet and rise. This morning, family, it's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. The moment you became a Christian and a believer, your mandate for life changed. It's no longer about your dreams, but about His. It's no longer about your agenda, but about His. It's no longer about what you want, but what God wants. But God is trying to say you, if to tell you this morning, if you seek me first, all of these other things will be added to you. You don't have to stress and worry, but try to do things from your own strength and your agenda and your dream will bring you worry, concern, and it will bring you to, the, to your knees where the only thing you can do is run back to the Father in times of trouble. God says, no, my daughter, my son. Do not put me the last on your agenda. Reprioritize your life. Seek me first. And all these things will be added. Let's close our eyes. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every single person here right now. That your presence be with them. That your kingdom be established in their hearts. That we are a church, Father God Almighty, that is a kingdom first church. Father God, that we are a church that understands that we operate according to the mandate of heaven and not the mandate of this earth. We operate in a different realm. We have a different king. We have a different leader. And we are not just saved because he's our savior, but because he is the Lord of our lives. And when he is the Lord of our lives, we go according to his statutes. We go according 
to His ruling. We go according to the way He wants it. We go according to His ordinances. We go according to His ways and not ours. Because when we seek Him first, we will add it all afterwards. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And with that said, family, those online, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. May God richly bless you. May you seek first the kingdom. Our banking details is at the bottom. Go out there and make sure that you are seeking first the kingdom of God and His ordinances and His agenda. And He will add it all unto you. Family, we may come to the front and we may give. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Family, we've come to the end of our encounter this morning. There's just a couple of announcements that we just want to mention here. Amen. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm so excited for our birthday coming up. Amen. Crossover.